Good morning. Um, let's call to order the meeting at 10 01. And vice chair, would you please take roll call and announce if a quorum is established? Okay, uh, let's see Pamela brief. Present. Patricia Trout present. Andrew Bowden. Present. Susan Landry. Present. Don Rosinski. Present. We have a quorum. Or woman. Person. Thank you, Vice Chair Trout. Um, I want to announce that pursuant to government code section 11123.5, this meeting will be held by WebEx teleconference. Anyone interested in participating in the meeting remotely must join the WebEx meeting. Information and instructions to join the WebEx meeting are listed on the meeting notice. DCA will webcast this meeting for observation only. Committee members, please keep your microphone muted when you are not speaking. Members must keep their camera on during the meeting. When you wish to speak, please raise your hand feature or physically raise your hand on the video. When speaking, please identify yourself each time. And I'd like to announce that for each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for public comment and comments are limited to three minutes. Um, for the LATC voting requirements, all motions and seconds will be repeated for the record and votes on all motions will be taken by roll call. Um, I wanna thank our um, CAB board, CAB liaison, Ron Jones, um, for attending this morning. Um, good morning, Ron, and thank you for being here. I also want to make an announcement that it is Andrew Bowden's last meeting. Again, <laughs> we keep thinking it's your last meeting. I'm hoping that this is another fake last meeting. Um, but uh, according to records, Mr. Bowden's grace period ends in June. And I just wanna thank you, Andy, for all of your support of LATC, um, the landscape architecture profession and um, protection of the public health, safety and welfare. Um, you have gone, gone above and beyond in your tenure. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pamela, and thank you to all the board members and staff. Uh, it's been a great run. It's been, I can't remember how many years now, 15 years, something like that, 14, 15 years. So I leave with a heavy heart, but leave also knowing that you know, we've accomplished a lot in that time. So I'm very proud of the work that the LATC has done. So thank you again. I appreciate the opportunity to serve the people of California. And we, we thank you for helping get that work done. Thank you again, Andy. Um, I also want to make an announcement that um, because of personal reasons, I will need to leave the meeting at noon. Um, and so if we are not complete at that time, um, Vice Chair Patricia, Patricia Trouth will um, take over as um, meeting chair. Um, so. Um, I will I will announce myself at noon so that it can be recorded and put on the record um, when I exit. Um, so at this point, I'm going to ask the members of the committee if they would like to make any introductory comments. Seeing none, we will continue on. Um, at this point, I will ask members of the public if they would like to address the committee for any items not on the agenda. Identifying oneself is voluntary, and at this time, we will open the meeting for public comment on any items not on the agenda. And this is the moderator. We have opened up the hand raise and Q&A uh, features in WebEx. If anyone attending via WebEx would like to make a comment on an agenda item that is not currently on the agenda, you may 
click on the question mark icon and then type the word comment into that text box or you may simply click on the hand icon and as a reminder each person will have three minutes to speak with a 15 second warning if you uh, let's see we do have someone who has raised their hand to speak uh, stephanie land landragan i will send you a request to unmute your microphone and you're unmuted Thank you very much, Chair and uh, board members and staff. I uh, have tried to download the uh, packet for today, and it's the CAB packet. It doesn't have the LATC packet in it. So, um, Stephanie, can you help me with that. Yeah, um, they're they're being put together um, at the at the moment. So, if you scroll down to Oh, let me Page 338 is. Thank you. <laughs> kind of All where right. It starts. Thank you very much. There we that go. Was Thank my, you, um, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a while to find it as well. Yes. All right. And I do not see any further requests for comment. Do you have any public attendees in the room who'd like to comment? I believe the room is still muted. We we don't have anyone here. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Shall I close that public comment feature? Yes. Thank you, moderator. You're welcome. Okay. We are now on agenda item D, the legislative update. I'll ask Laura Zuniga um, to present this agenda item. Good morning. Um... Just have the one item. This is SB 1452. It is the board and LATC sunset extension. The bill is currently in the Assembly Business Professions and Consumer Protection Committee. Um, it will. It has the extension for both programs. It has a few minor changes. It will likely be amended to include a few more of the suggested statutory changes that both the board and LATC recommended in its sunset review report. Um, but changes I would consider to be more administrative. We're not expecting any structural changes to be included so that the board and LATC will be extended as is, is the open expectation. Any questions? Any questions from the committee members? No, um, John. Yeah, I just, I just have one. Um, I know that there's a statutory deadline that all bills have to be approved or rejected. Is is that uh, by June 30th? Is that correct? It is not by June 30th. It's um, the legislature has various like deadlines throughout the year. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but essentially it needs to be approved before the legislature adjourns, which we're an even year, I think, is either the end of August or mid September, and then the governor has 30 days from then to sign it. So. Okay. Okay. So there's a good chance we won't know what the final outcome is until later this summer. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? All right. Um, at this point, um, do we open for pub for um, any public comment or questions at this point? Yes, please. Okay. Thank uh, you. Moderator, please open for public comment. Thank you. You're welcome, certainly. So uh, public comment has been reopened. If you would like to make a comment, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand, or you may look for the question mark icon, click that, type the word comment into the text box and click send. As a reminder, if you're on a mobile device that these options may be behind the three dot other options on your mobile device. Each speaker will have three minutes with a 15 second warning. Are there any comments on the uh, legislation update? And I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please, thank you. You're welcome. We are now on agenda item E, 
the 2025 strategic planning update from DCA Strategic Organizational Leadership and Individual Development Office, Ann Fisher, Strategic Business Analyst and Facilitator will present this agenda item. Thank you. So in addition to being your moderator, I mm -hmm. am your strategic planner for this year. So I would like to go ahead and take a, a look at the process that you will be undergoing in, in an overview fashion. So first we will cover what when, what, why, and how we do strategic planning. Um, strategic planning is the process that organizations use to define their direction and decide how to use their resources to achieve their mission and goals. It talks about helping define what your organization is, what it does, and remind everyone of why you're doing it. It is critical to a, becoming an efficient and effective organization. Uh, it is also legislatively mandated, and it does help to achieve short-term and long-term objectives. Uh, however, but to it, for a strategic plan to work well, it must contain specific goals and measurable objectives, as well as a plan for achieving them. So the, the stages that we use, we use a five-stage process, and that includes a survey of all your stakeholders. That includes licensees, professional organizations. Hopefully, we can get it feedback from consumers and clients as well. Then I put together a report of the survey results, and then we'll hold a workshop to identify some of the objectives that seem appropriate for you, for the committee. So this is a look at the roadmap, and we've done our preliminary meeting with uh, Kim and Courtney. Uh, we will be working on the environmental scan. That's the report that comes after the survey. So we will do the survey and then write those up. And then we will do a, a session where we create the facilitation plan and conduct the session. After that, we'll write up the plan in uh, government appropriate language, and then we will work on to action planning where staff and management will decide who's going to do what and how it's all going to get done and how everyone will be measuring success. And this year, as you may be aware, uh, the governor had issued an executive order to strengthen the state's commitment to California for all by directing state agencies and departments to take additional actions to embed equity analysis and considerations into all of policies and practices, including strategic planning. And the way that we are going to be practically incorporating these diversity, equity, and inclusion elements is that we will be adding uh, questions to the surveys. We will be talking about uh, ideas that uh, licensees and consumers and professionals have about how to add DEI into your operations. We will include the analysis in your report. We will be encouraging DEI elements as you develop your objectives. And we will be reminding all the planning session participants to consider DEI impacts as you make your policy decisions. So the components of the successful strategic plan are taking a look at where we are now, and that's embedded in your mission statement, your values, and the results of the survey that we do. We look at where you're going that's going to be included in your mission, in your vision statement, as well as the goals and objectives. And then at the end is how will we get there? And that is an, a function of the action planning process with management and staff. So the mission statement that you have currently is on the screen. This is the where are we now? And the answer to this, where are we now, is dictated by your mission and values. So this is a statement that defines the purpose of your organization and explains what it does. If you would like, during the planning session later in the fall, you may choose to revise this. Do you have any sense at this point of whether it's 
we are comfortable with it or you'd like to revise it in the fall? Um, I can't say one way or another um, personally. However, I believe we looked at this, um, this mission statement not too long ago. So I think we we might be okay with it as is. Um, okay. But um, I certainly would welcome any um, any thoughts from um, the other committee members. John. Uh, John Roshinsky. Yeah, I uh, I agree. I I think we've looked at this statement several times. Um, it comes across to me as being a little dry, but uh, I guess it's straight to the point. And uh, for that reason, uh, we may want to just leave it as is. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes dry is clear, right? <laughs> Right, yeah. right. An objective. I can so, yeah. certainly see that. Okay. Yes. And, um, yeah. Yes, Andy Bunner. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I concur uh, with what Pamela was saying. I think that we did take a look at this either at the last strategic plan session or it might have been the one prior. So I think this is relatively recent, although, you know, you can always wordsmith something a little bit here and there, but. For the most part, I think it says, you know, pretty succinctly what it is that our mission statement is. All right, great. Thank you for your feedback. I won't then schedule a large chunk of time to revisions because it feels like mm -hmm. it's, as you said, moderately recent and still appropriate. So that's great. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. My only, my only question, Anne, is on the mm -hmm. mission statement because of um, because of the uh, strength in California for all. Do you see um, boards or committees putting anything in their mission statement specific to this charge, or is that um, identified later on in their strategic plans? Um, there's room certainly in some elements. Um, I don't recall seeing a lot of organizations and boards and bureaus changing the mission statement itself, but they may throw some phrasing into what we're going to talk about next, which is the values list. Right. Um, and then a lot of it actually comes during the action planning. If you were to have an objective, for example, that said outreach to a variety of students, then they would be able to go during action planning and saying, okay, what languages and what, you know, rural and urban populations, that sort of stuff. So I think it's largely a wish to have everyone aware and mindful of the issue of DEI. But I agree, mission statements are supposed to be broad enough that hopefully they would include all of that anyways. Yes. So not very many clients of ours have been ad adapting DEI language into the mission. Great. That That's what seemed appropriate to me. I just wanted to confirm that. Thank you for that explanation. Absolutely. Good to hear we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. So as I said, the values that you have are going to be sort of a guiding guiding principles of how you do your work and uh, they communicate your core priorities how stakeholders are treated the desired culture that you want to establish within your organization at this stage if you chose to you might want to think about adding diversity equity or inclusion values in there um, if you'd like i can go ahead and allot a few minutes during the planning session because I think there might be room for some addition of that element. Okay, great, great. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, the next element of where are we now is the environmental scan. And as I said, we'll be talking with uh, you, well, whoever the committee members are in the fall, we may lose Andrew, but um, talking with committee members, management, and staff about how operations are going, how things are going, but also reaching out to the external stakeholders. It's always a challenge to reach everyone. Surveys are never very popular for someone who's got a busy professional life, but we do try and, you know, get in touch with licensees, but also professional associations, educational associations, schools, and students. 
and anyone else who might be affected, including other government agencies that you liaise with regularly, people like that. So um, we'll go ahead and do the survey and put together the report based on what we hear back. We call this a SWOT analysis because it covers strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So SWOT, not SWAT. So that's the, the way that we do that scan and analysis. For the vision, this is your vision statement. Um, it like It's good to provide meaning and it shares your destination of what an ideal world will look like if you accomplish all of your work. Um, and again, if it's pretty recent that you've developed this or modified it, you might not need to make time during the session. We'll certainly show it, but it sounds like you might want to, uh, you know, take a quick look, but not spend a huge amount of time refining. Okay, fantastic. Yes, I think yeah. that seems fair. All but, right. Um, does anybody on the committee have a difference of opinion on that? No. Okay. I think we're in agreement. Thank um, you. I was just going to say, um, I, I don't at this point in time, but I will take a look at this and maybe come up with a couple suggestions when we actually meet to discuss it. All right. Thank you, Chair Wyszynski. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm wonderful. Not and chair. I, I'm, <laughs> that, I went back to my old, my old term member. <laughs> Um, this is super. And yeah, we certainly will go over this again during the session. It's just a sort of a time management thing of whether we're going to allot a half an hour to really thrashing through it or not. So good to know. Um, another tool that we use to show where we're going is the goals that we've sort of subdivided your work into. Uh, one of the things that uh, Kimberly and Courtney and I discussed and chose to probably add would be to add the term licensing to your professional qualifications. Uh, most of our boards and bureaus at DCA, a core portion of their work is in issuing licenses and renewals, and that sort of work might have gotten left out or not explicitly called out. So our, it, I see some nodding heads. Is everyone in fair agreement with adding that term? Yes, absolutely. Great, great. So these goals are more long term. They give general direction. When we get to the fall planning session, we will talk about objectives, which are shorter term that fall under that. But these are the main sort of goalposts and signs of where we are going as a committee. Uh, as I said, once we get to the session in uh, November, we will be developing the objectives that we found in the trends that we saw in the survey results. Um, let's see. So in general, if you'd like to think of strategic planning as a house, uh, your mission and your values and your vision make up that first foundational layer of your organization's strategic plan of your house. And these are pretty permanent and they change only if occasionally under very special circumstances. Your goals make up the second layer, and those are like the walls and rooms in your house. They're fairly permanent, but they can change a bit, as we just saw that we added licensing. So um, they're not as set in stone as the mission and vision statements. Objectives make up that next layer, and that's like the paint and the furnishings, and they get updated much more often every four or five years or so when we do a, construct a new strategic plan. And then action items after that will be the steps that you take to make these updates and changes to the paint and furnishings. So if we want to step away from the house metaphor for a moment and define the components, the mission values and vision are the core of your organization. It's the purpose of why you exist. The goals are the desired conditions that your organization needs to achieve in order to be successful in its mission. And they're sometimes directly or indirectly mentioned in the mission statement, but they could also be units or departments within your organization. And then to better understand the importance of goals, we'll talk about objectives, and those are the individual measurable efforts taken to reach your goal. 
objectives can be developed from the observed weaknesses that we find from the survey results. Uh, we can also find issues from the sunset reports and the discussions that you've had around that. Those are the sorts of things that may find themselves in the objectives area. And then, as I said, afterwards, we will, after you've got your objectives identified, we'll get there. How will we get there is by the staff work, and that's going to be the management team meeting with solid cons cons consultation to develop the, of, you know, assess the available resources, outline the steps that would be involved in accomplishing things, assigning tasks to different roles, establishing target time frames. Uh, they, these sorts of action planning steps are reviewed by, you know, the legislature during sunset to see that you've accomplished what you said you would hoped to. And as a part of action planning, we ask programs to look at how will you measure progress. You'll establish some performance measures and use some, we provide some tracking tools so that you at every meeting you can probably get an update on how things are going with the different objectives and the accomplishments. So these usually a strategic plan usually goes anywhere from three to five years, depending on the group, and you can make it shorter if you'd like to. And we've got, you know, charts and graphics that you'll see in the meetings to show how you're doing along your plan. So thank you for your uh, attention and enthusiasm and input. And I look forward to working with you more fully on this in the fall. Uh, do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Ms. Fisher. Um, I don't have any questions, but I'll open it up to the committee for any questions at this point. Uh, this is John Roshinsky. Uh, I just, will this session be in person? Do we know at this point in time? We are scheduled to be in person. That's our November uh, meeting, I believe it is, and it's a two day uh, meeting. That's correct. Is right we're we'll still submit still a, a request to meet in person. We do have to get a travel exemption, but we will definitely work on that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. And Susan, I think you're still muted. Susan? Yes. Yeah, there you go. Is it still scheduled for November 7th and 8th? At that point, yes, we're, we're looking at those dates, yes. Okay, thank you. Welcome. All right, would you like me to entertain comments from the public if there are, there are some uh, WebEx attendees? Yes, I'm assuming, um, I wanted to just ask staff if there were any questions for Ms. Fisher. We do not have any questions. Thank you. That was very informative. Yes, I agree. That was very, very thorough. Um, thank you very much. Uh, yes, please open for public comment. Fantastic. So if anyone in the public would like to uh, ask, make, make a comment about the strategic planning overview, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand or you may look for the question mark icon, click that, type the word comment in the text box and click send. Each speaker will have three minutes with a 15 second warning. And Stephanie Landegrant Landrigan, you may, I'm gonna send your request to unmute. Go Thank ahead. You. Certainly. Thank you and uh, good morning again, uh, chair and members. Um, the strategic planning session is always going to be an exciting time to look at uh, new activities that are happening I, across the world, too. So I wanted to make sure that the scan includes some of the national issues that are um, really occurring elsewhere, along with licensure, some of the actual legislation that is out there and some of the bills that are asking that uh, there be uh, opportunities for, uh, what is the word, loans and um, savings to pay for licensure. So I, I think those are important issues that need to also come into the scan here and how California is involved. I know we, uh, the other issue is uh, education. As an educator, I think it's really important to know 
what is happening within education that is happening. I know you mentioned that you would be talking to educators, but I think some of the issues that are being addressed by education are should be important issues to um, consider, and I will be happy to send you some of those ahead of the November meeting. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, on the putting on my planning hat again. Um, so Kim McDaniel has been listening here as well as I have, and we will certainly make an effort to include educators and uh, we will discuss the importance of including national dialogue in the survey results. Um, I would very much encourage you to put all these thoughts into your survey response. If you do, you know, when, when we do open that up, that's not going to be for a couple of months, but it's absolutely critical that we get full feedback. So I hope that you're able to do that. Uh, I do not see any other requests for public comment at this time. Uh, shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome and thank you for your attention. Thank you again. You're welcome. Um, we are on to item F of the agenda, the update and discussion um, on the Council of Landscape Architectural Registration Boards, CLARB. Um, and at this time, I'll ask um, Kim McDaniel to present this agenda item. Hey, um, thank you. So this agenda item is um, an opportunity for uh, members to share the committee work that they've been uh, responsible for or involved with. And I know specifically, um, John, you had some things that you wanted to share last time. And so we definitely want to um, provide that opportunity for you as well as other uh, committee members. Great, thank you, Kim. Um, Member Roshinsky, would you like to present your work? Yes, John Roshinsky. Um, yes, I'd like to uh, report this morning about the experience requirements working group that I have been participating uh, in. Um, the group uh, to date has met three times um, and the, uh, the basic um, objectives of the working group were to examine uh, a number of key points that uh, CLARB is looking at um, aligning the experience requirement um, with the education requirement and other aspects of the um, uh, uniform standards. And so there were three key areas uh, that the working group has looked at. Um, the first is to provide better guidance to member boards for how experience is gained and evaluated. And again, working within the confines of the uniform standard, that was a point that was brought up early, is the, um, uh, the focus is now that there is a uniform standard to look at how states are assessing uh, both experience and education in um, providing their candidates with uh, uh, guidance on towards licensure. Uh, another uh, key point was to increase consistency among member boards on how they evaluate experience. And so um, they're looking at trying to align um, the experience requirements in the uniform standard with how each individual jurisdiction is um, assessing and tabulating uh, experience. And then the third is, uh, again, to create continued buy-in and support for members for the uniform standard. So it, this is essentially a way of specifically addressing experience um, requirements and how the boards assess uh, experience um, as a way of strengthening the uniform standard and, and again, getting buy-in. So essentially what we did um, is the working group when we first met back in March, uh, we essentially laid out what the 
current experience standards were in the uniform standard. And uh, part of that effort was uh, a survey was done of uh, member boards looking at uh, essentially three key areas. One, it's like, what are their current experience requirements? Two, how are those experience requirements administered? And what I mean by that is what types of experience do the particular jurisdictions currently accept or do not accept? And then thirdly, um, tying all of that in with uh, what changes would be required to meet the uniform, the new uniform standard. And so what we did is we just went through um, basically uh, the member survey first, just to get a good feel for all of the different uh, jurisdictions and how they're doing this. Um, but essentially there were um, three key areas. One, and one of the primary questions that we looked at is uh, supervision of experience and, and how is that defined? Um, we know that um, pre-COVID, uh, most experience was uh, monitored directly between employer and employee. Um, we know that after COVID, uh, where a lot of workers are working remotely and there become specific issues around monitoring experience that uh, resulted from that. So we tried to better define what uh, direct supervision actually means, and we've developed a, a statement around that. Um, the next area was what experience is accepted. And part of that effort was looking at uh, how the profession is changing. It's becoming more international. Um, we also looked at uh, full-time versus part-time experience and how much credit should be given for part-time work. Um, we looked at alternative um, ways of achieving experience, such as pro bono projects or other volunteer type um, projects. And then, um, and then lastly, we looked at unverified experience. And there are instances where um, candidates are uh, submitting an uh, experience that they're asking credit for that for one reason or another cannot be unverified. And just an example of that is uh, a person may have been working for someone who has passed away. And because that person is no longer around um, and they were the direct supervisor, uh, there's issues around um, whether or not that unverified experience should be accepted or not. And then lastly, we looked at administrative approvals that rather than the candidate uh, applications having to go before the board, that if the candidates are applying for licensure um, under um, sort of like the uniform standard or the standard pathway, whether or not the uh, uh, the jurisdictional board, um, staff should have authority to just directly approve um, on an administrative basis uh, for that. So we, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the first meeting was in. March, we met in April, and then again last month in May. Um, the report that's been drafted with the uh, draft language and everything is now with the CLAR board. Um, they will be uh, reviewing that and approving it uh, with any particular changes that they may recommend. And then uh, 
the working group will be meeting again later this month on the 25th to go uh, through all that one more time. And at that point in time, when we have all the final language and everything, I'll be able to share that with uh, with our our committee at that point in time. I don't think that there was any particular issues per se um, regarding what our current experience requirements are and 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 how we typically go through that. I know I spoke a couple times with Nicholas um uh, barnhart earlier in the uh in the process just to clarify and verify on some certain things uh in regards to that and did not uh, see or hear anything that uh, raised any level of concern so again i think um uh you know part of the clarb's effort on Revising all of this again is to uh, continue pushing for adoption of the uniform standard, and that's something that we will have to continue monitoring and and uh, discussing uh, in the future. Great. So um, I, I'm open to any questions if anyone has any. Um, thank you, um, Member Rosinski. We really appreciate you. Um, providing this update and, and also um, serving on this working group. Um, thank you very much. I have a couple of questions. Um, first off, you had mentioned that um, CARB will we be reviewing and approving. So is that scheduled to happen prior to your June 25th meeting? I believe so. Okay. We, we right. were told that um, the mem their uh, their board is meeting, uh, if not already, sometime early this month. Great. And that uh, they would be uh, presenting whatever their, either their approval or their recommendations for further edits uh, when we meet on the 25th. Awesome. Thank you. Um, look forward to seeing it when it's complete. Um, I'll open it up to the rest of the um, the members. Does anybody else have any questions for John? Um, I do. Okay, Vice Chair Trout. Okay. Yeah. So, um, John, I was just wondering if um, there was any discussion about um, NCARB's um, framework they have set up for experience only. So it's it's kind of set up like an internship, so to speak. Yeah, we uh, we did discuss at length the end carb approach and uh, we're told pretty early on that CLARB is not interested in following that same model simply because the way that end carb tracks experience is completely different. It's much more structured and uh, requires um, recording actual hours in each job task, whereas uh, CLARB's approach was to leave it more general and, um, and essentially not wanting to hold candidates to particular job tasks, but rather um, that they meet uh, a broader definition of what practice is in in uh, landscape architecture. So, is this um, is this something when you said CLARB, that's the direction? Is that like the board that's that's making that decision, or? Well, that's it's not a. I would say that that's staff. Uh, because it was staff that was presenting all of that. So I was under the assumption, and there was, again, quite a bit of discussion around this, um, but I was under the assumption that uh, staff was presenting this the way they were because that was the direction of the board, or at least came out of discussions with the board. Thank you. Um, Susan, uh, member Lander, I see your hands up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I kind of remember, it's like not this last meeting, but one or two before, uh, the state had us open up what professions could get years of qualifications. 
And one of the last times you mentioned that that wasn't what carb, there was some conflict. Am I remembering this right? Like we gave, I think it was geologists, we gave them a couple of years, but carb wasn't wanting that as the list of experiences. Is that still an issue? Well, no, I, I think Clark's approach, of course, is they're looking specifically at uh, the traditional pathway where you have a four-year LA degree from an accredited school and two years of experience. And as long as you get that, um, then you qualify. There was discussion about alternative pathways and I think Clark's approach is more or less to, at this point in time, is to leave that up to the individual uh, jurisdictions to define what that is and, and what they give credit for. Um, of course, they are pushing for adoption of the uniform standard, which in the case of California would, would definitely limit or eliminate uh, a number of uh, credits that we would give uh, based on what our current practice act states. So um, I think uh, it's still up to us to define what we wish to accept and give credit for. Um, but we were told early in this process on this working group that we were going to focus strictly on the uniform standard, the CLARB uniform standard. And that's what the uh, that's what the focus would be. Okay, so if I were, I'm going to pick geologists, and I could get two years credit at the California level, would that still then be able to be submitted to CARB? I guess I'm still a little confused about that. Um. I doubt I doubt if it would be because they they don't recognize that. Hmm. And this was also in part not just to qualify for licensure, but it was to qualify for CLARB certification, which is different. And that's much more limited, much more narrow than than what would typically be accepted for licensure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's good to identify. Um, thank you for identifying that, that there, this is, this is specific to certification for CLARB? Uh, that's, that's the primary focus, yes, but it does relate directly to qualification for licensure as well. Okay, all right, thank you. Member Landry, do you have any other questions at this time? Anyone else? Okay. Um, thank you again, Member Roshinsky, for this um, presentation and your update on this. And thank you for serving on that, that working you. group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, at this time, we will move on. Um, we are at, sorry, I've lost my place. One second, please. We're at, well, um, you, oh, sorry to interrupt. Would you mind, um, we should open this item for public comment before we move Oh, on. yes. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for reminding me of that. Yes, at this time, can we open up for public comment? Certainly. If anyone would like to make a comment on the previous agenda item, you may look for the hand icon and tap that to click to raise your hand. You may look for the question mark icon, click that to and then type the word comment into the text box each speaker will have three minutes with a 15 second warning are there any comments on the uh let's see yes the presentation and i do not see any requests for comment shall i close the public comment feature yes please thank you very much you're welcome okay um, at this time, we are on agenda item G, the update of the Department of Consumer Affairs. And at this time, I'll ask Yvonne Durantes, DCA Board and Bureau's Relation, to present this agenda item, please. 
Hi everyone, good morning. Yvonne Durant is here, Assistant Deputy Director of Board and Bureau Relations. Happy to be here today and provide a couple updates for you. Um, happy to repeat any of the items or answer any questions at the end as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and just jump right into it. Starting off with the revised 2024-2025 state budget proposal that was released. On May 10th, Governor Gavin Newsom released the May revision of the proposed state budget that reduces and stabilizes spending following the COVID-19 pandemic. The current budget proposal includes cuts of one-time spending by $19.1 billion and ongoing spending by $13.7 billion through 2025 and 2026. A nearly 8% cut to state operations and a targeted elimination of 10,000 vacant state positions. Once the state budget is finalized, DCA will share all information and guidance received from the Department of Finance. In the meantime, DCA boards and bureaus must continue to scrutinize expenditures and maximize cost savings, only authorizing expenditures that are mission critical and essential to operations and public services. Moving on to military uh, licensing resources, on May 29th, DCA hosted a live webinar to share information about licensing resources available to members of the military and to their families. The webinar was held during Military Appreciation Month and attendees were welcomed by Undersecretary Melinda Grant. Um, they were provided a demonstration of the Federal Professional License Portability and State Registration Portal by Chief Information Officer Jason Piccioni and had their questions answered by executive officers and staff from the boards of barbering and cosmetology and physical therapy. The event concluded with remarks from Director Kirkmeyer, encouraging attendees to share the licensing resources with others and reiterating DCA's commitment to supporting the military com community. The webinar was attended by members of the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and others who support the military community. An archive of the webinar will be available on DCA's military resource webpage. Moving on to board member travel expense claims. Um, today is the, dead, the claim deadline. And so as the end of the fiscal year quickly approaches, um, we do ask that travel expense claims be submitted by today. Claims submitted after today will still be processed However, the state controller's office will not issue any payments until after July 5th. All travel expenses and advances submitted for travel on or after July 1st will be processed for payment after the 2024-2025 budget is signed. For questions regarding travel claims, please contact Board and Bureau Relations. Moving on to a board leadership and the director's quarterly meeting. On June 11th, DCA will meet with board presidents, vice presidents, committee chairs, executive officers, and bureau chiefs at the quarterly leadership meeting. Agency Secretary Moss will open the meeting, so we hope that all board leaders are able to join us. Agenda items include updates from DCA on the state budget, information security, DEI activities, and an important presentation from the Office of Digital Innovation on Plain Language Access. The meeting invite has been distributed to board and committee leadership, so if you have not received this invite, please reach out to us. Moving on to a scam alert reminder. DCA has learned of a recent increase in scams targeting licensees, and though the nature of the scams do vary, um, they are very similar in that they involve individuals who are falsely identifying themselves as board employees and telling the licensee that they are under investigation. The scammers attempt to gather personal or financial information and may even demand payment. Boards are urged to be vigilant and proactive in providing licensees with tips on avoiding scams. I'm moving on to the diversity, equity, and inclusion update. DCA's uh, DEI steering committee will meet on July 26th. So if you do have any ideas um, that you'd like to share or would like for the committee to discuss, 
please do let your executive officer or myself know. And as a reminder, DCA's learning management system, also known as LMS, has many DEI related training courses available. Um, board members are encouraged to participate in trainings and continue to grow in our DEI efforts. However, um, these trainings are not required. Lastly, if you have been appointed or reappointed within the last year and you have not completed your board member orientation training, um, we will be holding our next board member orientation training um, on June 18th. And so uh, we do request that you please um, register for that as soon as possible if you do plan to take it. If you are unable to take it, um, the next one will be held on October 22nd. And just as a reminder, these are held uh, virtually. And they are nine to four, so a full day of training. That's all I have for you. Um, unless there are any questions, um, thank you for having me today and allowing me to provide these updates. Thank you very much. Um, I have no questions, but I'll open it up to the committee for any questions. No one seeing none. Um, can we open up for public comment at this time? Certainly. If anyone would like to make a comment on the DCA report, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand, or you may look for the question mark icon, click that, type the word comment in the text box and click send. Each speaker will have three minutes with a 15 second warning. Are there any comments on the DCA report? And I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. And thank you again, Ms. Durantes, for your presentation. Um, we are on agenda item H, budget update from DCA budget office. Um, and I would like to ask Luke Fitzgerald DCA budget analysis to present this agenda item, please. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Pamela. Um, good morning. My name is Harmony DiFilippo, and I'm the budget manager with the DCA budget office. I want to thank the committee and executive staff for allowing me the a few minutes to present on agenda item H, uh, the committee's expenditure projections and fund condition statement. So first, I'm going to start with the committee's expenditure projections, which is page one of your handout. Uh, these projections are based on actual data through fiscal month nine. This report includes 22-23 actual expenditures in green, as well as the 23-24 budgeted and projected expenditures in blue and orange. As we move to the end of the document, you will see the committee had a beginning base budget of 1.311 million and is projected to spend a total of just over 995,000, creating a reversion to the fund of approximately 315,000 or a reversion percentage of 24.06%. The next document I will go over is the revenue projections, which is page two of your handout. This includes receipts collected through March and projected revenue to year end. I will go further into the projections as we transition into the next slide. The next slide, page three of your handout, is the committee's fund condition statement. As a reminder, we read this document from top to bottom and left to right. The left column is the committee's prior year 22-23 actuals. It shows a be, uh, the committee began 22-23 with a beginning balance of 958,000, collected 868,000 in revenues with 114,000 from initial license fees, 719,000 from license renewals, and 35,000 was collected from the issuance of citations, fines, delinquent fees, and other revenue. The committee expended 1.173 million which includes 87,000 in direct draws to the fund for statewide pro rata and pension payments. The committee ended 2223 with 653,000 in reserve balance or about 7.1 months in reserve. 
For the current year, 23-24, the committee projects revenues of $1.195 million, with $156,000 projected from the initial license fees and just over $1 million from renewal fees and $29,000 from the issuance of citations, fines, delinquent fees, and other revenue. The committee's 23-24 expenditures are based on the governor's budget with FM9 projections and is just under 1.1 million between authorized expenditures and direct draws to the fund, leaving the committee with a fund balance of 752,000 or 6.7 months in reserve. The budget office will continue to monitor the committee's revenue and expenditures and report back to the committee with the monthly expenditure projections as we continue to close fiscal months in the current fiscal year. A few things to note on the fund condition. The fund condition is a snapshot in time. One of the main factors driving expenditure increases in future years is a result of personal service adjustments. These include general salary increases, as well as employee compensation and retirement rate adjustments. <clears throat> the budget office includes a conservative ongoing 3% increase to the expenditures on the fund condition statement to account for these ongoing incremental adjustments. You will also notice revenue is projected static in the out years. The fund condition statement includes the projected increase of, in revenue for the initial and renewal license fees in current year and the out years. And lastly, I would like to note to the committee that any future legislation or unanticipated events could result in the committee's need for additional resources, which could create cost pressures on the fund. The Budget Office will continue to monitor the committee's fund condition statement and keep the line of communication open with the uh, executive staff for any future needs or expectations. Again, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present at today's meeting, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeFilippo, um, and my apologies on the announcement at the beginning. No <laughs> um, didn't realize it was going to be you. Um, I don't have any questions at this time, um, but I will open it up um, to the members for any questions. And I see Member Landry, your hand is up. Is there, a, thank you. Uh, is there a state requirement of how many months in reserve that we have? Um, so it's three to six months is typically considered sufficient, and then there's a cap at 24 months. So currently the fund looks great and the months in reserve as well. As you can see, it's also growing um, now that we have the, the increase reflected on the fund condition as well. So if, the, if you look to the out years where it's 11% in reserve, is that something that uh, gets addressed at that time of reevaluating the fees. Uh, it seems like a lot of excess to have 11 uh, months in reserve. I will note that the fund condition does show the board extending to its full um, appropriation in those out years. So that also could change based on um, savings. Um, as far as when the board would discuss any future fee changes, um, I will refer to um, Laura. So I'm sorry, Susan, you're asking if when the reserve gets up to 11 months, if we would look at making a change? Yeah, at what point? I don't know that we have to wait till 11, but at what point do we look at adjusting since the fees are so high right now? Um, I think we would just continue to monitor on a yearly basis. I mean, that's several years out, so it's really hard to project exactly what it's going to be. And knowing that costs continue to increase, um, I would be surprised if we needed to have a reduction in order to stay under any kind of threshold, but we will certainly keep monitoring it. Thank you. Are there an, oh, uh, Member Ryszynski, I see your hands up. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, and I have uh, several questions. Um, I will start with the expenditure projection report. 
Um, my first question is in regards to the uh, figures that are shown for the permanent positions, um, looking at year to date and then projection to year end, um, does that take into consideration uh, that we have vacant positions on staff at this point in time? So the projections for personnel services on the expenditure document is based off of the current positions filled and any vacancies that were not projected to. Okay. Um, so that projected year end value could actually be less if um, positions remain vacant at least. As far as the um, as far as the re uh, remaining balance at the end of this current fiscal year, um, yes. However, I don't think uh, at this currently for June, unless someone is hired in the month of June, I don't anticipate that in um, increasing or decreasing. Okay, so the fiscal year ends at the end of June, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. okay. Uh, my next question was in regards to um, the two travel lines. Um, I'm just curious, uh, for in-state travel, it looks like there was a projection of roughly 10,500 for the fiscal year. Um, I'm just curious. I wasn't aware of, of us uh, traveling to any meetings or anything. Um, this past year, uh, or at least. Uh, so I was just curious what that was based on. So there is the actual year to date for travel um, is listed on here. So your year to date for travel is in the blue and that has already, it's at 8,460. So there's just a small estimate um, for potential travel in these last uh, two months um, to be on the safe side. However, if there is no additional travel, then there will be an additional $2,000 savings. All right. And I'm just curious uh, for the facilities line item, it shows us as actually at year end being in a deficit on that. Um, I'm just curious uh, if what what's driving that factor. So the main factor within the facilities is the rent schedule. Um, and so even though it looks that it is in the negative based off of the budget, we look at the OE and E more as a whole. So as a whole, there's no concerns. Um, and uh, I would say that majority have that uh, difference in facilities line items. Right. Uh, can you explain real briefly the C C slash P services, internal, external, what those two line items are for? Yeah, so you, that's your um, C and P services. So you have um, under C and P external, you have your attorney general and your office of administrative hearing charges are within there. And then under your C and P external, that's where you have administrative charges, um, information technology, credit card fees, and then any kind of expert witnesses or um, exam development. Um, those are all captured within that category. Okay. And for the line item departmental services, we're showing a deficit at year end, projected deficit on that. Um, what, uh, what exactly is that line item for? So there's two uh, main categories within that section, and that is your um, that's contracts with the Office of Professional and Examination Services, as well as the um, interagency uh, fee that LATC pays to CAB for part of the administrative um, side. Okay. Um, and I guess my last question on this sheet is: I know that. Um, every year, uh, there's a budget that's set um, for each one of these line items. Who exactly is involved in setting setting those budget amounts? So that budget has it does not get reset each year. It's been the same budget for several years now. Um, 
we are looking at realigning this with the next budget. Um, it won't necessarily change the bottom line, more of just aligning within those categories where charges um, and contracts are compared to categories where there are historically no charges um, to just kind of give you that visual that it's the budget and you're spending close to it, but still overall the OE and E, we really look at it as a whole. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, uh, all right, I will move on to the next, uh, the revenue projection report. Uh, my only question on this one is the, um, the renewal fees um and i guess it would also be for initial licensure fees um has are we aware of there being any indication that with us recently raising our our fees what the effects uh are on that to date are we seeing i mean is there any way that we can look and see if uh there's a drop in renewals or that type of thing so currently we're still, um, it's still relatively new when the fee increased. So it's a little too early to kind of tell how or what impacts there may be. However, I can say so far that it is coming in close or if not a little bit higher than projection. So as you can see, kind of in those category totals, it is projected slightly higher than what the budget was. And the budget did account for that incremental increase for those fee increases. Okay. Do we... At this point in time, do we know when everyone who is renewing will be um, renewing under the new license uh, fee structure? In other words, um, when will everybody who's going to renew will be under under that? Because I know it's kind of staggered throughout the year in regards to when people are renewing and I will defer to Laura for that question. Um, everyone renewing after January 1st is subject to the new fee. So it's just the license term is two years. So you could get some people who haven't renewed yet and won't renew until close to the end of 2025 that haven't paid the new fee. But otherwise, okay. everyone's paying the new one. Okay. So it'll be by, by 2025, everybody should be under the new fee structure, correct? Yes, by the end of 2025. Okay. Okay. Uh, my last couple of questions are on the fund condition. Um, and I'm looking specifically under revenue and uh, transfers, uh, the, the renewal fees. Um, I'm assuming that that figure of 1306 is based on uh, all renewals happening underneath the new fee structure is that correct yes that is correct okay okay and then uh my last one under expenditures the anticipated ongoing business modernization costs and it looks like in uh 25 26 there's an anticipation that there's going to be additional fees uh that we're going to be paying under that uh, can you explain what those uh, what what those particular costs are going to be associated with? So that's the anticipated cost for the ongoing maintenance and operation of the business modernization. Um, so that was just an estimate added in there, so that the board has an uh, the committee has an idea of what um, estimated anticipated costs are to give you a better look at the fund as far as the actual cost at this time. Um, we do not have the the true actual cost that it will be as we move into the maintenance and operation. Okay. I believe we will have that information available potentially next year on the fund condition. Okay. And so we could probably anticipate um, that starting in 2526 uh that those maintenance annual maintenance costs will be roughly in the 50 to 70,000 range somewhere around there 
at this time, that is what it's based. I, that's what we've determined. However, um, I can't guarantee that it would that what the actuals will be once they determine that um, in the in the future BCP. Okay, and and my last question on this that just came to mind is, as more boards and bureaus uh, come online in in modernization. I'm assuming that those maintenance costs will be spread out over a larger pool. Is that correct? Um, that's not something that I would be able to answer. I can um, would need to determine that from our um, Office of Information Services IT department. So I can reach out and get some information and get that over to Laura. Um, but the costs per program are are specific. So if an, if more programs join an additional cohort, they will have their costs identified. Um, so these are their co the costs currently are specific for CAP and LATC, based off okay. of their program needs and their system. Okay. All right. Um, I think for now that answers my questions. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee members? Um, at this time, I'll ask for um, it to be opened up for public comment. Certainly, if anyone would like to make a comment on the budget report, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand. You may look for the question mark icon, click that type the word comment into the text box and click send. Each speaker will have three minutes with a 15 second warning. I do see a request for comment from Stephanie Landrigan. Stephanie, I'm sending you your request to unmute. Go Thank ahead. you very much and good morning again. Um, Stephanie Landrigan, uh, Director of the Landscape Architecture and Horticulture Program in uh, UCLA and a licensed landscape architect in California. I do have a question that is uh, similar to uh, member Wyshynski's is that um, because of the volatility of fees, the and that a 24 month cap is uh, what we would have. Am I correct in understanding you said that when there is when the reserve reaches the 24 month cap, it has to be uh, reconsidered and um, and re uh, reduced. That's the question. I'm asking it of the DCA uh, finance person whose name I can't read. <laughs> Laura, would you like to respond? Sure. So there is, I think, a general statutory cap of 24 months for a program's reserve. So at that point, we would look at making a reduction. But, um, you know, we would work with the budget office. You take into account the program size. Like you said, this is a fairly small program. So it is more volatile in terms of 24 months for LATC is a lot different than 24 months for the contractor report. Correct. So my recommendation would be uh, that when it does reach the midpoint of those 24 months, which would be when the reserve reaches 12, is that there uh, be a discussion on what would be an appropriate fee. And because it takes uh, at least a year for some of these things to happen when you change uh, the fee structure, I think that would be prudent because uh, it's not, um, it is diff difficult for those of us who feel victimized at time when there's a huge change uh, for our practice. And um, we need to look at a way as a former LATC member to, to create our own method of stabilization since, uh, because as we all know, as a small board, small committee, it's very, very difficult to um, have such huge swings. That would be my recommendation. And uh, thanks for a pretty thorough budget uh, review. I uh, listened intently. Thank you so much. And I do not see any further requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? 
Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much again for the budget report. Um, we are on to um, agenda item number I, um, reviewing possible action on March 22nd, 2024 LOTC meeting minutes. Um, first, I'll ask the members if there's any comments on the minutes. And I will then ask for a motion to approve the March 22nd, 2024 LATC meeting minutes. So, so moved. moved. So. I see Andrew Bowden um, as a motion to approve. And do I have a second on that motion? Yes. Susan. Uh, Susan. Um, Member Landry is seconding. Um, at this point, I will ask if there's public public comment. Um, since we have a motion and a second received. Absolutely. If anyone would like to make a comment on the motion, you may look for the question mark icon and click that. Once that's open, type the word comment and click send, or you may click on the hand icon. Each speaker will have three minutes with a 15 second warning. And I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close that feature? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. We are on to moving along. We are on to Jay, our executive officer's report. Um, so at this time, I'll ask. We, have to vote. we didn't vote. Oh, we didn't vote, did we? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm just cruising right along here. Uh, yes, at this time, um, can I ask the vice chair um, to um, please uh, take the motion or okay. take the vote? Okay. Uh, let's see. Pamela Brief. Aye. Patricia Trout. Aye. Andrew Bowden. Aye. Susan Landry. Aye. And John Rosinski. Aye. Uh, motion passes. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Now we will go on to our executive officer's report. Um, update on the board's administration, management, examination, licensing, and enforcement programs. So I'll ask uh, Laura Zuniga to present this agenda item, please. Good morning. This starts on page 351 of the packet. Um, it has both the board and LHC information. I'm just going to highlight the LHC information. Um, we've already discussed the budget and then a little bit about business modernization, but um, we had a second release earlier this year. The next thing that will be released, the next main release, will include uh, a consumer complaint form and some um, enforcement functionality. I don't have an exact date for that yet, however. Um, one second. So then moving on, we have um, information on outreach. LHCC staff did a few outreach presentations at UC Berkeley and Cal Poly Pomona regarding the exam and licensing process. And then we have information on our social media statistics. LHCC does not have any current regulations pending. Um, nothing to cover there at this time. So then moving on, we have the the licensing and examination statistics. You can see um, after the board's information, we have the CSE performance. So it, for first time test takers, we have a pass rate of 56% for the most recent reporting period. And then moving on from there in enforcement, we have the most common violations for architects um, and similar information. Uh, follows for LATC on the number of complaints we've had, how they've opened, citations issued, and then any formal discipline that's pending. Um, underneath that chart, you can see the LATC most common violations, which are pretty similar, um, except that there's no continuing education violations. So pretty similar to the boards. Um, and then there are no enforcement actions for the most recent reporting period. Um, and just to note, um, as a brief update, during the board's meeting yesterday, the board had a presentation on artificial intelligence. Um, which the members found very interesting. So if LATC is 
interested in information, we can place it on a future agenda for an update from what the board is talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, much appreciated. And yes, I was at the um, CAB meeting yesterday um, during the presentation on AI, and I will say that it was very informative. Um, and um, CAB during their meeting had discussed um, taking action um, in some of their subcommittees, and there was also conversation about pulling in um, a member from LATC to be part of that, um, th one of those subcommittees. Um, so um, we should, um, I would highly suggest that we have someone uh, at our future meeting, have someone come in and talk to us about that. It was very informative. Are there any questions on Laura's report? Uh, yes, John Roshinsky. Um, yeah, I just had a question. I noticed that we did not have the latest um, uh, landscape architect national exam results in here. Is that just simply because they weren't available or uh, they were presented in the last meeting? Yeah, they weren't available. The most recent administration was in April, so we'll present them in the next report. Okay. All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the members? At this time, I'd like to open it, request to open for public comment, please. Thank you, Laura. Public comment will be open And if anyone would like to make a comment, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand. You may look for the question mark icon and click that. Type the word comment into the text box, then click send. Each speaker will have three minutes with a 15 second warning. Are there any comments on the issue? And we do have a request for comment from Phil Armstrong, CCASLA president. Phil, I'm going to send your request, unmute your microphone, and you'll have three minutes with a 15 second warning. And go ahead. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman uh, Brief and uh, other committee members. My name is Phil Armstrong. I'm a licensed landscape architect and president of CCASLA. Uh, I too was at the CAB meeting uh, yesterday and just wanted to um, uh, echo uh, Laura's uh, executive report on AI. Um, you know, this technology is um, uh, going to be a blessing and a curse for sure. Uh, certainly, uh, it um, brings in a watershed of technology advancements to our profession um, and certainly. Uh, car carrying the paradigm shift that we have all uh, encountered with um, adapting to uh, to climate change, and uh, obviously, if we've been around the profession long enough, changes in irrigation design and and uh, and plant palette and and planting techniques. Um, but I, I think it definitely is worth uh, a study, um, both with uh, LATC and CAB that. Uh, this technology brings with it some um, uh, some cautions, uh, certainly on uh, the human scale and human element element, and taking uh, taking the individual creativity and the designer um, somewhat out of the mix. So uh, certainly um, uh, viewing it uh, with uh, a, a, a level of trepidation, but certainly. Um, excitement, um, certainly um, back in the days when we've we all shift from hand drafting to uh, to computer aided design. So I just wanted to uh, to echo my comments uh, on AI assisted design. Thank you very much this, for this uh, comment. And I do not see any other requests for comment at this time. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, we are on to agenda item K, review of future committee meetings. Um, 
the tentative LATC and board meeting dates have been identified for 2024. Um, at this time, our uh, next meeting is scheduled for December 7th and 8th, as um, we already discussed. Uh, that will be our strategic planning session as well. And Lauren mentioned that they'll be putting in a request for um, actual travel on that date. Um, the board meetings for CAB are um, scheduled for September 13th and then again on December 5th and 6th for their strategic planning. Um, I would like to, at this time, um, see if we could get um, members of the committee um, to volunteer to be present at either the September or December um, board meetings. Uh, John Roshinsky, um, I should be able to make the September 3rd meeting. Okay, great. Thank you, John. And I also have a related question. Um, I know that the CLARB annual meeting uh, will probably be coming up sometime in the fall, if I'm not mistaken. And yes. that, us that usually includes us uh voting on who we want to support in regards to the Clark ballot goes um i'm just curious uh if we will need to call uh any kind of special meeting to address that particular issue uh, laura well, this is laura if i could add to that um we're not approved to travel to the Clark annual meeting this year due to the um budget restrictions on travel i don't know if there's the ability to vote remotely at that meeting i can check on that and then see what might be necessary i would note like for the board with ncarb when they have voting they discuss it but they don't vote on actual positions and leave it up to the voting member so that's also an option if, if there is the ability to participate remotely all right well I guess my recommendation would be that if we're restricted from travel to the meeting, we need to let CLARB know that um, sometime between now and then. I have told them that we have restrictions. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Laura, for letting them know that. Um, and then also, um, I would like to make a suggestion um, since our next meeting isn't until November. Um, Laura, can we discuss at this time um, a potential meeting in September? Um, we could, um, Kim can follow up with you next week and see and see what agenda items we might have if there's a need yeah. for a meeting then. Yeah, okay, sounds Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, do we do we have anybody that can attend the December meeting at this time for um, CAB? I, I can attend. This is Patricia. Thank you, Patricia. Put you on for that one. I I did have a um a question that I just wanted to throw out to the committee, um as well as staff. Um, if the CAB is having their strategic planning session on the fifth and sixth. If um if we could get that agenda, if the is if there's any type of discussion um about you know the the board and the committee and any potential of interacting with one another, it, it seems like that would be a good time to um to discuss it. So I'm wondering if we could have a representative available during their um, strategic planning session, and and also if we could you know get a copy of their agenda as we get closer. Um, we can provide you information as we get closer. If I recall correctly, and, and our moderator would know better than me since she does this, we don't really have an agenda, as I recall, for strategic planning. It's just going to be whatever the board kind of discusses to what they want objectives to look like. Um, we will have some idea, though, I guess maybe after looking at the environmental scan and seeing what direction it might go. So, yeah, to the extent we have any information available, we can provide it to the members. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Oh, let's see, our moderator has their hand up. <laughs> Thank you. Question. Yes. 
Well, I wanted to elaborate on the strategic planning session and the plan for that. Um, generally, it's, uh, you know, multiple hours. And so if you have the ability to be there for the whole thing, that would be fantastic. But I think it's possible that some of the issues may come up periodically through the various goal areas. So it's not going to be really very easy to pinpoint what time those issues would be discussed, but it would be that during that meeting, I think it might be beneficial to have some awareness of the thing, the issues discussed. Thank you very much. All right. Um, at this point, do we, I believe we need to open up for public comment again. Is that correct? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please open for public comment. Thank you. Certainly. If anyone has any comment on the future meeting dates, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand. You may look for the question mark icon and click that. Type the word comment into the text box and click send. I do see we have a comment request from Stephanie Landrigan. Stephanie, I'm sending you your request to unmute your microphone. And thank you're you here. very much. Uh, again, um, thank you very much, Chair and uh, committee members and staff. My question is, was the CLARB meeting originally budgeted and with the change in the governor's budget, it was removed or it is not going to be enacted? So, LATC typically attends the CLARB meeting, so I presume that it's built into the top portion of our budget. I don't have it in front of me anymore, but um, it would just, since we're not able to attend this year, that money just isn't going to be spent. Actually, I guess it's in the next fiscal year. It won't be spent, um, and it would just be part of the, any reversion or cover areas, other portions of the budget where we overextend. And then my, this is a nexus question. So at the CAB meeting, I heard that some of the board members are going to go to the MCARD meeting. Is it because it's in this fiscal year? Why is that uh, approved and uh, the CLARB meeting not? Neither meeting is approved. NCARB has some virtual options for members to attend. NCARB does? Yes. All right. So, um, Unfortunately, in my opinion, that's that's a problem because we are the largest state. We have the most, I would say, licensees in a state, and it, it it it's very difficult. And I understand the budget restrictions, but if there are changes within the budget because it was budgeted, is there the possibility to uh, take advantage of of a travel if it is uh, opened up again later? maybe this summer? Is there that flexibility, Laura? You're asking if the restrictions get lifted, is there the ability to again request permission to travel? Yes. We can ask again, yeah. It's, it's a bit of a process in terms of the time it takes, so we will be getting close, um, and I'm not aware of the restrictions being lifted, but certainly we will continue to monitor, see what might be available. Okay. Thank you very much. And I do not see any further requests for comment. Shall I close that feature? Yes, thank you very much. And it looks like John has his hand up. Oh, uh, Mr. Rosinski, do you have yeah, a comment? I just had a really quick <clears throat> comment and this would be for Laura. If one of us was to attend the CLAR meeting on our own dime, would would there be any problem with that? Uh, LATC representatives aren't approved to travel to the CLAR meeting, I think regardless of the funding source. But I can look into that further for you if you'd like. All right, thank you. Um, Andy Bowden, I see your hand is up. Do you have a comment? I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so seeing as how we're not 
uh, allowed to attend in person to the CLARB meeting? Can we lobby CLARB to allow us to attend virtually? Can they set up a virtual setup for us or for any state that's that that's not able to travel? Um, we'll ask them what their virtual options are. They have had them in the past. I think they um, have kind of lessened what is available. And it's a balance for CLARB, I understand, because the more people that attend virtually, um, you know, the fewer people that are registering to go. Also, if I recall correctly, even virtual attendees for CLARB meetings need to pay a registration fee, um, which I don't think we would have the ability to do. But I will check and see what options there are. Okay, thank you. Um, since we had discussion after public comment, do we need to reopen it again? Uh, none of the comments were substantive, but it's always a good time for public comment. So if you'd like to take some, we certainly can. Um, we will open it up just out of protocol one more time for public comment. Um, certainly. If anyone would like to make a comment on the discussion, you may look for the hand icon and click that to raise your hand or look for the question mark icon, click that, type the word comment and click send. Are there any further comments? And I do not see any further requests. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We are now in agenda item A uh, L, uh, closing comments. Um, I just want to take a moment to um, thank member Andy Bowden again for his time and um, we will definitely miss you on our board, um, on our committee. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank staff um, for their help in um, all of the preparation, putting all of the information together and any of those that, that are still present at the meeting that presented today, thank you very much um, for your time. Um, does anybody else from the um, committee want to say anything? I see member Landry with their hand up. Yeah, I just want to say goodbye to Andrew again. I think we said goodbye at the last meeting. <laughs> Uh, it's been great working with you. You have such institutional knowledge. It's been so helpful. You show passion and interest in our profession, and we definitely will be missed on the board. Thank you, Andrew. Well, thank you very much for your kind words, Susan. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you to all the board members, our committee members, and, and the uh, CAB board and, and staff. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's been my pleasure to serve with you. And um, I'm going to miss being on the committee, but um, I will be attending as as audience from this point forward. So, again, thank you all very much. I, it's greatly appreciated. And member Rusinski, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, John Rusinski. Uh, yeah, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank. Andy, for his service, um, I've always considered you a mentor and a friend and have learned so much from you over the years, and we're talking a lot of years. <laughs> but uh, anyway, thanks again, and uh, I look forward to continuing to keeping up with you. I appreciate that. Are you calling me old, John? Is that what this is? No, I'm not saying we're old, Annie. I'm just saying it's been a long time. <laughs> it has been a long time. A lot of years. Well, thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. And member child, I see your hand is up as well. Yes. Well, I, you know, we we did say goodbye once, Andy, but definitely gonna say it again. Thank you, you know, for your your leadership and your friendship over the years. And um, I'm looking forward to comments, as you said. Yeah. Well, so. well, thank you, Patricia. You know, at the last meeting, my internet conked out just as you were getting on to say your your respects to me. And so I didn't get a chance to publicly thank you for for those comments. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's been, it's been a joy, you know, serving with you. 
serving with everybody. Uh, it's just been a pleasure. So, um, you know, I, I just appreciate the opportunity and, and uh, it's another chapter in the book that's coming to an end, but more chapters to be written. So we'll see what happens from here. Very happy for you, Andy. <laughs> on to on to bigger and bigger and other things. Um, at, at this time, is there um, any comment from staff at this time? No, just thank you to Andy for all of his dedication and service. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Laura, and thank you to staff. It's greatly appreciated. Well, with that, with all of those lovely comments, and he's feeling the love, I'm sure, I am going to go to our agenda item M and say that um, at 1146, we are adjourning. This is the moderator. I realized that it may be too late, but we did have a raised hand for closing comments. Oh, my my apologies. Or, uh, yes, I I am okay with going back if we're allowed to do that. Uh, the council would have the best idea of whether we're allowed to go back. That's fine. She says that's fine. Okay. Wonderful. All right. So Tracy Morgan Hollingworth has a con raised hand and you'll have three minutes for your comment. I sent your request to unmute. There you go. You're unmuted. The same as everybody else. And you've been just a such a dedicated um, member. Um, I love all your um, your um, photos that you send out to everybody. Um, Newport Beach can't be the only, you know, great beach around. Um, I know you've shared some of the San Diego scenes that you've taken photos of, and I'd love to be able to, um, to you know, commission one of those if I could. Um, so let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Any anytime. Be hap happy to to talk to you about it. And you're welcome to any of the photos that, that I have that I've taken. So excellent. Thanks. I give them away freely. <laughs> Love it. And there are no further public comments. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, we will go to adjournment again at eleven forty. 48 um and do we vote to adjourn we do not okay excellent then we can say happy weekend thank you all for being here today and um thank you to the members for your time and again thank you to staff um have a great weekend thank you all, all right. very thank much you. thank you bye -bye. everyone bye Thanks. Bye-bye.